us today. Please join with me in thanking Eric Coleman. Okay, good. This one works. I can turn that one off. Um, hi. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of SendMail. Now, histories are, uh, if you were like me in, in high school, history is boring, but sometimes you can actually learn stuff from it. So I'm actually going to talk about this um, in two parts. But uh, let me try and first express to you why you might actually want to listen to me. Um, SendMail is an old program. Some of you may have noticed that. It's more than 30 years old, uh, believe it or not. But it has survived amazingly well by software standards, um, incredibly well. It actually was one of those pieces of software that really did change the world. It was created entirely without any particular corporate support. Uh, sorry, IBM. Uh, it thrived in a rapidly changing world. I cannot begin to express to you how rapidly it was. And some of you might ask, how did this happen? Why did SendMail do so much better than so many other things? So I'm going to talk about this in two parts. Part one, what actually happened. I'm going to actually kind of rush through this because I've got a lot of material. Um, and uh, then we'll get on to part two, which is the more interesting parts. I will take questions at the end, hoping that we'll have enough time. Uh, I'm afraid if I take questions during the talk, I won't get to the end. <clears throat> so let me start off with a bit of background. Um, the first work on what is now SendMail started in 1980 at UC Berkeley. While I was working there, I was a uh, student and staff. Uh, it had no official support. Uh, including from the project I was working on. I was supposed to be working on uh, relational database management systems, which were brand new back then. In fact, the official word was they couldn't possibly work, but we made them work anyway because we were too stupid not to. Um, the internet did not exist. The ARPANET did, but um, the internet did not. And it was built purely as a matter of necessity, which is probably one of the reasons why it succeeded. So let me try and give you an idea of what the world was like in 1980. I'm just, forgive me, I'm guessing that a lot of you were not in the prime of your career in 1980. <laughs> CPUs, kind of a commodity CPU, was a 16-bit machine. Those are actually kind of the high-end ones. The low-end ones were 8 bits. Uh, they were substantially, well, less than 1 MIPS, million instructions per second. I'm thinking of, for example, the PDP-11. Disks were dramatically less than three gigabytes, um, or one gigabyte in size. They were the size of refrigerators. Uh, the, uh, the, since I was on a database management system project, we had a lot of disk space. We had 300 megabyte drives. Um, and the day we finally got enough in that we had an entire gigabyte of disk space available to work on very large databases, we actually asked ourselves how we were going to find enough data to fill this thing. <laughs> Memory was definitely less than one megabyte. You paid by the kilobyte. Uh, networks were less than or equal to 56 kilobits per second. The ARPANET backbone was 56 kilobits. And uh, although Ethernet existed at Xerox PARC, it wasn't really out there yet. Relational databases were really a research novelty. Uh, that's what I was working on. Mobile phones actually did exist, but they were those, you know, brick-sized things that people went poof, down on the table. Um, they were large, they were expensive, very expensive, and cameras used film. <laughs> <laughs> now, in contrast, today, CPUs are typically, you know, 64 bits. I did a back-of-the-envelope calculation. They're over 50,000 MIPS from under one MIP. Disks, commodity disk drive, two terabytes you can fit in your back pocket, no problem. Uh, memories, main memory is over 100 gigabytes, that's, you know, fairly common. Uh, network, uh, you know, at home you get megabit for DSL, uh, and OC3072 is 160 gigabits, so that's long haul now. Um, no SQL is hot. Relational database management systems are boring. Phones, of course, are tiny, ubiquitous, and effectively free. And the cameras are digital included with the phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me t show you what the mail system was like um, actually before I started. Here's my first architecture slide. 
Now, some of this may be a little hard to see, and I apologize for that. Um, this was as it came from Bell Labs. Bin Mail was both the user interface and, well, it was everything. Bin Mail was the mail system. There was a network called UUCP, so it could send mail into Bin Mail. Uh, you could send mail using UUX, Unix to Unix Execute, which had its own spool directory, and the local mail spool, i.e., your mailboxes, were on the side. Nice. A little bit about where Berkeley was. Uh, we, when this whole thing starts, we actually did have our first VAX, so I lied a little bit about the 16 bits. 32 bits were around, but people were debating whether anyone ever really needed that much address space. Um, it was the main machine for computer science. It, uh, the VAX was a canonical one MIPS machine, and everyone in the department had an account that shared that one machine. Um, there were more ASCII terminals in offices than ports. Oh, Windows systems? you know, way in the future. Uh, there was a patch panel in the mail room so that uh, you could go in and patch one of the ports, open ports on the machine into your office so you could work. Uh, that, of course, meant you had to pull somebody else's plug out. Um, you might want to figure this out, uh, where this was going. And uh, there was a store and forward net called BerkNet, which had been uh, written at Berkeley by a guy named Eric Schmidt, who was formerly CEO of Google. Uh, and uh, happened to be a student at Berkeley. Um, interesting guy. So the problem, the Ingress project, database management project that I was on and was kind of you know running the machines and so forth, that was the default system administrator, uh, got an ARPANET connection. Uh, the ARPANET connection, by the way, I said the 56 kilobit backbone, we couldn't afford that. We had a 9600 baud line to the ARPANET. Everyone in the department decided they really, really needed to use this connection. Uh, we had a 16-bit P2P11. It was not enough to give everyone in the department uh, an account. So we could free up a grand total of two, count them, two teletype ports to go into that patch panel in the mail room to share. Um, I am exaggerating when I say professors got into fist fights in the mail room. I never actually saw fists. <laughs> and everyone complained to me because it was obviously my fault that I hadn't fixed this thing. I should point out, by the way, TTY ports. At the time, you go, well, just put on more TTY ports. $5,000 for one 9600 baud TTY port. So this is the genesis of the program called Deliver Mail. I observed that they didn't really want access to the ARPANET. They didn't want Telnet. They didn't want FTP. They wanted email. That was the killer app. We had a network that connected the Ingress machine that had the ARPANET connection and the VAX that they were on. It's software, 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 software. I can write software to glue software to software. You know, how hard can this be? Just forward it. And for the routing, uh, conveniently, everything used different characters. So there were colons for BerkNet and at sign for ARPANET. So I could just queue off the characters, and it would be pretty easy. I have to say, I say that now, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to write it, couldn't figure out how to do it. And then one day, I sat down and just started writing code. And as soon as I did that, everything became clear. So before I wrote this, this is actually what the architecture looked like at Berkeley. So this is what other people had done. Down the left-hand side, you've got the ARPANET stack. Uh, mail was part of FTP back then. So the FTP daemon sent into a mail spool. There was a user agent called send message, uh, which is how you interacted with the mailbox. There was an outgoing spool, and it used FTP to send out. And then over here, there's the bin mail. There's our mail with UECP before down this side. Um, and then there's also, BerkNet has been hacked in here. There's a user interface that a guy named Kurt Schoens wrote called UCB Mail that was an improvement over bin mail, which pretty much, bin mail was uh, also a synonym for cat. <laughs> and, uh, and they had the same local mail spool file. Um, the coding, by the way, is this is the ARPANET code, which unfortunately I find I never kept a backup of this code, so I don't have it. The blue stuff was homegrown at Berkeley. The yellow stuff was hacked at Berkeley. The white stuff was fairly original. 
it's not just this. I want to show you this little piece of code because no talk would be complete without a piece of code. This is actual code that I found in bin mail on Unix when I started. There's, <laughs> there is at least one bug in this that pops right out. And I, I tell you now, research was Bell Labs' main machine. So somewhere in there that was hacked into the code, if you're going to research from anywhere on the net, you do this magic thing where you can drop the H on the end. There's something weird about converting hats to exclamation points. I don't know. It's just, it, it was weird. So design principles. I'm going in, I'm hacking the mail system. What do I want to do? First thing is, I'm just one guy. I'm working part time. This one probably actually drove all the rest of them. And it turns out, by the way, to be, probably be the main reason I succeeded. Don't redesign the user interfaces. I don't have time to do all of that. And even back then, people were getting kind of religious in their preferences about user interfaces. Don't redesign the local mail store, because there were too many things that actually directly read you know, var mail, mailbox. And all of those would have to get fixed. So I couldn't touch that. Um, I had to make deliver mail adapt to the world, not the other way around. Once again, just because I couldn't go in and find everything that had to uh, get hacked. Um, and kind of corollary change as little as possible. So I put in deliver mail. The architecture looked, after a little bit of shifting around, kind of like this. You can see, essentially, deliver mail is now where bin mail was before. Bin mail is kind of off on the side. Um, there's you, I had to have a dash D flag to tell it to deliver into the mail spool, because remember, I didn't want to touch that. So bin mail calls deliver mail, unless it's got dash D, in which case it goes the other way around. So there's this weird kind of dual handshake and whatnot. But fundamentally, it's, you know, it's what it is. OK, the problem with the solution. Inflexible compiled in configuration language, queued off those special characters. There was no address translation between networks. So if you had a UUCP address and you forwarded it to the ARPANET, the ARPANET still saw a UUCP address. Um, the parsing was both simplistic and opaque. Simplistic because it just looked at the characters. Opaque because when you got something, you had to know where it came from in order to figure out how to interpret it. In fact, there was an entire book written about interpretation of email addresses. But you know, it was supposed to be a quick hack, and indeed it was. Now, to give you an idea of how bad the addressing was, I'm going to give you a little table. That, by the way, is the title of the book that I referred to. Uh, <laughs> um, foo at bar, obviously, is an ARPANET address. It goes to host uh, bar user foo. Foo colon bar was Burkett, goes foo colon bar. Foo bang bar bang baz is a UUCP address, which either goes to host foo user bar bang baz, or if you're on foo, it goes to bar user baz. Foo percent bar at baz is the same kind of thing. It's either an ARPANET address to baz or to bar, depending on whether you are baz. Foo bang bar at baz has one of four possible interpretations. And the completely legal address, foo bang bar colon baz hat fritz at frots, has who the hell knows? <laughs> So something had to happen. <laughs> Berkeley was awarded the DARPA contract to build a standard platform for research. Before, on the ARPANET, everyone had um, basically their own home-built platform. It was PDP-10s, it was uh, IBM 360s, it was PDP-11s, it was Vaxxon, it was, you know, you name it. Bill Joy sort of said, well, you know more about the mail system than anyone else. Why don't you do this? I was young. I was foolish. Um, so I, you know, how hard could it be? <laughs> uh, it did require adding SMTP support. Well, no. Let me rephrase. SMTP wasn't written yet. It required adding support for whatever it was going to be. Um, I could have done that, but it was kind of going to, it's going to be kind of like the FTP protocol. I could have done it in an outboard process, which would have fit into the deliver mail model. But because there were multiple recipients, I couldn't have a single exit status to get the information back. So I'd have to have some kind of inter 
internal protocol, which was going to look a lot like SMTP. So I might as well just implement SMTP. That meant that I had to get uh, do a queue. Okay, now it turns out SMTP is pretty easy. Queuing is actually harder to do. If I had known at the time how hard queuing was going to be, I probably would have thought more carefully. But fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't. So I ended up writing SendMail. It came out in 1982 with 4.1a BSD, which was the very first version of, of BSD or Unix for that matter that had um, uh, TCP IP support in it. Um, had header rewriting so that it could normalize the addresses to be appropriate for where the message was going. Had support for SMTP queuing. Um, amazing new innovation, runtime configuration. Um, but there you go. So here's the architecture post SendMail. There'll be one more architecture slide after this. You can see essentially what's happened is SendMail is over here, there's now starting to be more user interfaces out there. Things like MH from RAND have, have come along. UCB mail is still there. Um, these things are still dealing directly with the local mail spool file. Notice there is no appearance of IMAP or POP here because they really didn't exist yet. Okay, but there's other services now that are appearing. There's fax software and SMS gateways or you know that sort of thing. And Okay, other than that, oh, and of, oh, dough, and the internet. That's, this is where the internet first appears, one little cloud up there. And the use of the SMTP protocol. So, in 1981, I left Berkeley for what was going to be a lucrative career in industry. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Um, by the way, if you're going to make a lot of money, um, most startups are not Google, as it turns out. <laughs> SendMail was picked up by most vendors of Unix-based systems. This was during the Unix wars. Everyone was going to be the Unix vendor. The Unix vendor meant uh, th this is the days when open source software, by the way, open source software existed before the Free Software Foundation. It just wasn't called that. Okay, the Free Software Foundation was more or less a reaction to what went on here. And everyone knew, knew that vendor lock-in was the right way to go, so they took Unix, which is a perfectly reasonable standard platform, and customized it in incompatible ways, and they did it intentionally. Okay, and SendMail, of course, had to be part of what got tweaked. And as a result, many versions sprung up. In 1989, for various reasons, I came back to Berkeley as staff, and one of the things that needed to be done was we were going to a CS subdomain because there were now enough computers that instead of being something.berkeley.edu, it was something.cs.berkeley.edu. I had to do some hacks, um, and that got me going on doing some, well, as long as I'm in here, I'll do this and, well, that and so forth. And it, it ended up turning into a major rewrite, which turned into SendMail 8. SendMail 8, you know, steal from the very best. I uh, went through, looked at all the other things that people had done, the various vendor versions. Many of them had good ideas, usually crappy implementations, but often some pretty good ideas. The open source community had done some pretty good work, notably IDA SendMail, which came out of uh, Sweden, and KJS uh, stands for King James SendMail by Paul Vixie. Uh, <laughs> Paul had dreamed that he could come up with a unifying version of SendMail. Uh, he didn't succeed at that, but SendMail 8 did. Uh, a lot of the work that had been done was on configuration, which was really pretty crappy uh, before. And, um, but there were also a bunch of code features. So important changes in SendMail 8. Uh, there was a major revision of SMTP, which is actually technically it's ESMTP today. Um, there were other new protocols, for example, delivery status notifications. There were actually a whole bunch of them, minor ones. More integration with other systems, things like LDAP were coming along here and, and so forth. So you needed hooks to be able to talk to other services. Uh, support for 8-bit mail, uh, important for internationalization multimedia. Uh, a, an entirely new configuration package with a totally different philosophy. Um, and um, there are a bunch of other minor ones. There was one other thing that was totally out of my control. 
And that was the Bat book, the, the O'Reilly Sun Mail book. This is written by Brian Castales, and I came along and, and uh, uh, worked with him on it. He mostly wrote, I mostly edited. Um, it dramatically increased the uptake of Send Mail 8, however, because there was finally like a book. And uh, it really proved to me that documentation counts big time, much more than I had imagined. <clears throat> now the problem is the net got bigger. And you know, Send Mail at SendMail.org at that point continued to drop pretty much into my mailbox. And I was trying to support people. Got some volunteers to help me, and that kept me things going for a while. But at some point, I couldn't remember. I'm still doing this part time for free, and I couldn't be doing any more coding. And I really wanted to get back to coding. So um, I came along and founded a company called Sendmail Inc. in 1998. The idea was to produce a commercial version. I'd be able to hire a couple of people to do support. Um, they could go off and do that. I could get back to coding. The world would be happy. Um, the reality is that starting a company is a lot more about money, marketing, and sales than it is about technology. Um, it also turns out that uh, SendMail, it was a big enough deal that on the day we announced the company, it made the front page of the New York Times. That turns out to work against getting back to coding. Uh, <laughs> Now, it turns out I could give the whole talk just about the formation of the company. There's a lot of interesting things to learn in here, but uh, that's not what this talk is about. Another thing, by the way, is it was one of the very first hybrid commercial open source companies. They, we had trouble getting funding because a lot of people thought it was impossible. Remember, you've got to do proprietary lock-in if you're going to succeed. That was the, just everyone knew that. Um, so, like, well, got to get off of this or I'll keep talking. So it turns out that the commercial entity did a lot of stuff in the open source. In fact, when I drew up this slide, I had forgotten how much was there. All the encryption and authentication uh, came from the commercial company. Um, prior to that, uh, encryption was illegal to export and so forth, so it never gotten into open source. Milter is the mail filtering interface, extremely important. Um, virtual hosting, multiple logical queues, lots of things that are designed for bigger sites, uh, sites that are uh, supporting multiple domains, etc. Uh, directory services, notably LDAP, uh, lots more checking, um, uh, the ability to do more spam checking and so forth. Um, most of these were driven by commercial needs on one level or another, but in fact the open source world needs them as well. So this is kind of what the, the email world looks like today. Substantially more complex. You see a lot of the same old stuff, but there's you know, now LDAP, Milters, um, there's uh, various access demons and whatnot. There's more than just IMAP and POP. There's, of course, Exchange, proprietary protocols like Mappy. There's Outlook. There's tons of user interfaces. Um, it's, it's actually uh, dramatically complex at anything other than the most trivial site. So, part two. So what? Who cares? So I'm going to try and give you some ideas here on what happens, things that might in fact be useful going forward. Um, you might call this lessons learned. So the first lesson is requirements change. They change all the time. Um, when I started writing send mail, really deliver mail, uh, other than the obvious thing of getting mail through at all, uh, quickly one of the major things was reliability. Um, so the mail either had to get to the destination or you had to get a bounce back. I can assure you that hell hath no fury like a professor whose grant proposal has been lost in the mail. <laughs> Rule number one, the grant proposals have got to get through. Then it became about functionality and performance. Functionality, you know, what, what's it going to do? Who's it going to talk to? You know, what stuff can you do? Functionality is almost always, you know, the first thing people want after it works at all. And by the way, a lot of um, projects usually die as a result of that because they put in too much functionality. But that's also another talk. Then it became about protection. Spam and viruses started to hit. 
And so it switched from the getting the mail through to keeping the mail out. And in fact, we have gone from a period of unreliable mail to reliable mail to unreliable mail because in the old days, it was legitimate to say the mail system ate my homework. Now you have to say the spam system ate my homework, but it's just as legitimate or illegitimate, depending on your, your perspective. Then the world started to get more into regulations and things, so it turned into stuff about regulatory compliance and so forth. This is what SendMail Inc. Uh, has done, does do a lot in this area. By the way, these things don't mean that the old problem goes away. It just means new requirements get added on. And increasingly, as particularly in this economy, it's about keeping costs down. So emphasis here, waterfall model does not work. We all knew that. It's just yet another data point. Um, and uh, th there's always new requirements coming along. N these days, by the way, uh, mobility and integration with social networking and stuff is becoming the, the hot thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about various design decisions and the, the evolution of SendMail. All of the things I brought up, bring up in here are things that people have taken me to task on at one time or another. Some of these decisions, I think, were in fact the correct decisions to make. Some of them were incorrect. We all make mistakes. I'm certainly no different. And the most interesting ones are the ones that were probably right, correct decisions then, but are wrong for today. And those are always going to happen. This, by the way, is in no sense an exhaustive list. So, criticism number one, it's an overly general solution. You know, the good news is you can do anything with SendMail. The bad news is you can do anything with SendMail. Okay, the reality was the world was in flux. When I wrote SendMail, the SMTP spec was still changing. When I say changing, I mean literally a couple of times a week. And by making a general solution, I could, when a new draft of SMTP came out, I could have it implemented by the next day and be getting feedback on it. New mail systems were coming in all the time. Uh, you just needed a lot of generality. Sometimes it's easier to build a tool than a solution. And so SendMail, in fact, is not a solution to the mail problem. It is a tool to build solutions to the mail problem. The reality is, as much as you'd like to say, well, but the world is so much better now. You know, everything's stabilized and so forth. The world is still ugly. It's still changing. It's still nasty. In retrospect, I would still build a general solution. I wouldn't do it in exactly the same way, but I think the fundamental concept of trying to build something as general as possible is, in fact, a good way of doing software design, up to a point. Rewriting rules, it's the way SendMail does both modification of headers and uh, parsing. It seemed like overkill even at the time, but I couldn't come up with anything better. It turns out it probably was not overkill. It was probably, in fact, uh, the right thing to do. Using tab characters as the active character was the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> My only excuse is that make files use tab as an active character. And I went, oh, that's a cool idea. And I talked to Stu Feldman a couple of years later. And he said, yeah, using tabs as an active character was the stupidest thing I ever did in my life. <laughs> Thanks, Stu. <laughs> um, people complain that it's ugly. And they go, well, why can't you just use something like regular expressions? <laughs> you looked at a regular expression recently? The concept of pattern matching, be it regular expressions, send mail rewriting rules, snowball patterns, whatever, they're meta characters, they're, they can get pretty ugly. The concept was right, okay? It's, it's pattern match and replace, but instead of using characters, which are regular expressions, it used tokens, and that was absolutely the right thing to do. There was a uh, system out of Bell Labs called UPUS that was uh, use actual regular expressions. And if you think SendMail config files look bad, you should have seen UPAs. Okay, the problem was the syntax could have been better, admit to that, particularly those damn tabs, and uh, the control flow could have been better. I would do the control flow differently. Message munging. 
Um, message munging, i.e. changing headers on the fly. This was absolutely essential for interoperability at the time. You could not get around it. Um, it is still heavily used, in fact. There's cases where you don't need to do header munging anymore. If you're taking, you know, from an ARPANET, or sorry, internet site, I'm showing my age here, to another internet site, and you're not trying to do anything fancy, you're not at a corporate gateway, you're not, you know, the whole list of ifs, um, you don't have to do it. So there should probably be a pass-through mode, something like that. I would do that today. But then there gets into the question, and I'll talk about this more in a few minutes. When you get a message that is wrong when it comes in, do you just pass it through wrong, or do you reject it? Or do you fix it? You know, SendMail fixes it today. Um, and there is no obvious correct answer to this. There probably is no correct answer. It's just a design decision. The syntax of the configuration file, well, I admit it's, it's no uh, you know, great beauty. Um, each line is, is typed by the first character of the line. So you know, there's options, there's rules, there's mailers, etc. There's no nesting. It's, it's a flat file. It was very, very simple at the time. Uh, remember, I'm running on a 16-bit machine. I couldn't exactly be loading yak into the process because that was just pure, absolute overhead. I needed something that could be parsed with the minimum amount of code. There's too much use of single characters. Option names initially were a single character. Uh, mailer flags still are single characters. In retrospect, you know, it's ugly. It is ugly, I admit to that. But it's not fundamentally flawed. Um, today, I would use something probably along the lines of the Apache syntax. But uh, the main thing I'd get out of that is some kind of nesting. Nesting is useful for, for example, doing options on individual SMTP ports, since SendMail now supports multiple ports. But you know, this is not fundamentally flawed. Um, embedding SMTP in queuing into SendMail, yes, I could have kept the core of the system simpler if I hadn't done that, but in retrospect, it was definitely the right thing to do for lots of reasons. The queue itself. Um, Q uses two text files per message. One is for the envelope, all the meta information, uh, including the header for various reasons, which may or may not be good, and then one's for the body of the message. When you want to run the Q, it requires that you scan a whole bunch of small files. And uh, file system performance isn't uh, as good as you'd like relative to memory speeds. That's going to come as a surprise to all of you, I'm sure. Um, but the ASCII format, I have to say, simplified debugging a lot. I've become a real, real believer in making everything ASCII wherever possible. Well, okay, you can make it Unicode, but the point is text. Um, in retrospect, it was, in fact, the correct decision for the time. Uh, today, I would do it differently. I'd probably keep the envelopes in some kind of database and messages in individual files just for uh, space cleanup, if nothing else. Um, KISS principle says this was the right thing to do initially. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, however, I will also point out that embedded databases um, that were sufficiently robust to work did not exist when I wrote SendMail. DB did not exist. DBM didn't work. Um, so I didn't have a lot of choice other than to implement a whole new database myself and remember, I'm a single programmer. I don't have a lot of time. So I did the simple thing. I'm sure you're all going to love this one. Using M4 con for configuration. <laughs> um, the syntax of M4 is painful at times, I will admit. Um, but I needed some kind of macro facility, um, or I had to build it into SendMail, and I wasn't going to do that for the reasons I've already described. So there's no point in reinventing the wheel. There was really nothing else that I could have used. The other choice was the C preprocessor. I could have used you know, pound include and pound define and that sort of thing. But uh, that really wasn't quite powerful enough. The main problem with M4 were those damned DNLs, delete through new lines. And there were absolutely no reason for those to go in there. I was obsessed for some reason, which I cannot 
reproduce at the time, probably severe obsessive compulsive disorder or something, of making the output of M4 look nice and readable. And lots of extra blank lines offended my sense of aesthetics. From the point of view of reading it, there weren't, you know, a new line is a single character. I wasn't going to be making the file so much larger that it was going to take an extra disk read to read it in or anything like that. So um, it could have been a lot cleaner and a lot less ugly and saved all of us, myself in particular, a lot of pain. Some tool was needed. Maybe M4 wasn't the right tool to use. Maybe there's a better tool today. It's not really worth changing. It's not a big enough thing. Now here's an especially important one. Uh, the choice to extend versus change features. This is one I think I got wrong, by the way. An example, masquerading. When I first, masquerading is the ability to say, instead of user at host.domain, it will come out as user at domain or something like that, regardless of which host you start from. Um, or um, uh, generics are the ability to change your login name to full name or something like that. I did it wrong the first time. It was just a mistake. But instead of fixing the existing feature, I added new features to do it. My philosophy that at the time was I didn't want to break existing sites. So I didn't want to have somebody put in a new release and have it suddenly start working differently because I thought that was going to create support problems for me. In retrospect, that would have been true. But it would have been less painful to have made it so that all the new people coming along uh, would have had an easier time of it. And what I could have done would have been to have uh, provided upgrade tools to say, when you install the new version, run your configuration file through this, and it will do exactly what it did before. Otherwise, you know, it'll do the right thing. I got this one wrong. And uh, in fact, this was kind of a theme. There were a bunch of places I didn't, br I intentionally did not break existing sites bec because I thought that would be a bad thing to do. And instead, I created a, a bigger problem for the future, like those tab characters, for example. Um, accepting and fixing bogus input. This is uh, uh, otherwise known as the robustness principle. Uh, AKA Postel's Law, be liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you generate. This was dogma at the time. This is a very difficult one. In fact, I'm supposed to be writing an article for ACMQ about this right now, and I find myself scratching my head a lot about what I'm going to say. The idea of the robustness principle is it increases interoperability, because if there's an ambiguity in the spec, then what you should generate protocol that is as limited as possible by the most conservative interpretation of the spec. But when you're reading it, you should use the broadest interpretation of the spec, and that way everything will work. The problem is that that means that broken software doesn't have any incentive to get fixed, because it will continue to be accepted. And that ends up creating other large costs down the road, sometimes very large costs. It was the right thing to do at the time, because everything was broken when I started. <laughs> okay, but at some point, I probably should have tightened up SendMail because it you know, was the 500-pound gorilla in the living room. And I could have put pressure on other things to, uh, to get better. How I would have done that um, without having you know, people with pitchforks outside my house, I don't know. But it probably was the right thing to do. It is actually, to me, still unclear what the right answer is to do today. The robustness principle seems so intuitive. You want robustness. And yet, it has this dark side. And I, I honestly don't know the answer to this one. Uh, if any of you have any thoughts, feel free to corner me at the break. So what would I do differently today? The first thing is, as I said before, I would fix problems as soon as possible. One of them was the tabs, um, the bogus features that I've mentioned. Um, I see I've got an extra closed paren on there. Sorry about that. Another one was the V7 mailbox format. I didn't want to change the format of Varspool Mail. I used the exact same thing that came from Bell Labs. That means that a line beginning FROM space 
um, separates messages. That's what came to us from Bell Labs. Ber people say it's the Berkeley format. It's not the Berkeley format. It's the V7 format. I did not change this for the reasons I've described before. I'm so sick and tired of seeing greater than from in the middle of text documents and things that have obviously gotten mailed around at one point or another in their distant past. I could have fixed this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know I could have fixed it. So that's one thing I would do. I would definitely use modern tools. A lot of tools exist that just didn't exist. Uh, exist today that did not exist at the time. I would use more of the tools, but only up to a point. I think people go tool crazy. Um, an example is SendMail has its own basically compilation environment builder, the, the build script, which goes around and probes everything and whatnot. I, I wouldn't do that today because there's other alternatives out there. I do, would use more privilege separation, which has kind of evolved at the time. I wouldn't go as extreme as postfix. I really don't see a need to have 40 demons running to send mail. Um, but you know, that's, that's just a philosophical thing. Um, I'd create a string abstraction. Uh, I love the C language, uh, but strings are, you know, the C's, you know, nasty, you know, the, the relative they want to keep in the closet. Um, it's, it's the weakest part of C by far, and I should have just gone and fixed it. The problem is it's hard because all the system calls, of course, you have to be converting between these, these uh, string formats, which is why I didn't do it. A couple of relatively minor ones. I'd separate mailbox names from Unix user IDs. Uh, today, uh, the concept of a Unix account and a mailbox have almost nothing to do with each other, and there's still kind of a built-in assumption in SendMail about that cleaner configuration file I talked about. OK, what would I do the same today? Um, I did a dry run of this talk for some grad students at Berkeley. And the first one, um, there was an audible drawing in a breath then. I want to see if it has the same effect here. <laughs> I would use C as the implementation language. Why? I mean, C is a dangerous language. You know, it's, it's power tools and there are no safety guards. Okay? But you always know exactly what's going on. Um, I've been doing, um, for one job I've been working on now, I'm doing a lot of stuff with object-oriented languages. And the more I work on them, the more I become convinced that object-oriented languages are a mistake. Um, more of a mistake than M4. <laughs> um, the um, object-oriented languages do too much under the covers. And C++ is the worst of the bunch because it makes you think that you can do things in a sort of safe, object-oriented manner, but you can't really. So you kind of have to be playing both sides. You get the worst of both worlds instead of the best of both worlds. I would continue to bite things off in smallish chunks. Okay, now I say this, you know, I'm not, I'm, God, I'm starting to sound like an old man here. I'm really not wild about agile programming. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a cop out for a lot of things, but it is, in fact, the right thing to do for certain things. And I like the concept of building a system that does something and then modifying it as opposed to be doing this big mega design, spending years building it before you, know, you can first do dot slash a dot out. And um, uh, you know, so there's a trade off there. The best thing I did on SendMail was syslog. I did syslog early on. Syslog did not exist before SendMail. It was done as a side project. I felt I needed some place to get the logging information that I was going to need for debugging an operation. And I produced a generic solution. Syslog is everywhere now. You know, every HP printer has syslog support. Um, absolutely the right thing to do. I don't know why nobody did it before, except that at the time, you know, you didn't have UDP, you didn't have sockets, you didn't have so forth. They used something called MPX files, which nobody's ever heard of anymore. Um, it, it was actually difficult to do, but it was worth it, every bit of it. 
Um, rewriting rules I would still use, but I would have a different syntax. Um, I would not rely, despite saying before I would use tools, I wouldn't rely too heavily on tools. Tools have a cost as well as a benefit. And I've worked on projects where you know, they never saw a tool they didn't like. And as a result, you have to start off by installing 30 or 40 tools to do anything. And oh, by the way, they interact in various ways. And there's an incredible learning curve. And every tool is idiosyncratic and so forth. There's a time when the right thing to do is to, in fact, just build what you need as opposed to putting in a tool that's quite a bit larger. Just one quick example. I've seen places where uh, systems that will use Lex, for example, to do parsing, uh, you know, basically scanning of input, and all they needed was Sturtok. Okay, Sturtok's a nice, simple thing that does a particular job, does it well, but oh no, I need to have a, you know a parser generator to do this. That's stupid. Okay, a few takeaways. Um, hopefully, you can use, um, you know. The KISS principle actually does work. Um, it works well enough. I will point out, by the way, that SendMail was a second system in the Brooks sense, and yet it still succeeded. And I think part of that was because I actually uh, had enough self-control to, to remember to keep it fairly simple as it went along. It doesn't look simple today, but each step was, was fairly simple and, and, well, compared to exchange, never mind. Uh, <laughs> If you don't know what you're doing, advanced designs don't help very much. I, I say quite happily, uh, I didn't know what I was doing when I started off. Uh, that's partially my own naivete at the time. It's also partially because the world that we know today didn't exist at the time. And so it's impossible to predict the future, for most of us at least, at least for me. Um, and so you need to actually think about the fact that you don't, no matter how well you think you know what's going on, you don't. Um, the world's a messy place. So, you know, just, just plan on it. Flexibility trumps performance when the world changes every day. You see all the time people who come up with these highly optimized solutions to the wrong problem. And uh, you do need to think about performance. That's really important. There's got to be a balance between the two. And I really do believe in flexibility. More takeaways. Um, fix things early, okay, which as I've told you, I didn't. Now think about it this way. If you change stuff and you fail, it doesn't really matter because you failed. Whereas if you succeed, the installed base just keeps getting bigger. So you might as well fix it now. And if you fail, then you know it's over and who cares. And if you succeed, you've done the right thing. Um, ASCII is great for internal files and protocols. It really helps with debugging a lot if you don't have to build a tool just to debug your tool. Um, documentation is a key to broad acceptance. Um, I can't begin to tell you how critical documentation is, and sadly, most open source projects have, still have not figured this one out. And um, most importantly, the design space is always changing. Now, you may say, okay, well, that was true of the mail system back then, but, you know, it doesn't apply today. It applies very much today. I had a discussion with somebody the other day saying uh, he turns off virtual memory entirely because as soon as he gets to the point where he's paging, he has a performance knee. So he'd rather have his system just die outright when he runs out of physical memory than have it start to go to you know, onto disk. So virtual memory, which was this thing that we absolutely all had to have, it was completely the right thing to do, now in a lot of situations is exactly the wrong thing. The design space has changed. Okay, cloud computing is a return to centralized administration. You are, in fact, handing the keys back to those people in those, those glass rooms. Okay, is it the right thing to do or not? Well, for a lot of people, it is the right thing to do. We move from the glass rooms to our desktop back to the glass rooms. Okay, the design space keeps changing. There's lots and lots of things where you can come up with examples on this. 
So the world keeps changing out from underneath you. It's reality. If you've got any piece of software that's going to last more than a few years, you're going to have to change the fact that the technology is going to change out from underneath you. Just going to happen. Um, this, by the way, is based on a chapter for a book that's uh, hopefully going to appear real soon now. Uh, the tentative title is The Architecture of Open Source Applications. Uh, I believe it's coming out through O'Reilly. I don't know when it's uh, uh, going to come out. The discussion was Christmas, but I think they meant Christmas last year. So, uh, <laughs> um, And uh, I have time for like one or two questions. Uh, Any questions? Yeah. Eric, if you were not Eric, and... Uh, Who would I be? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, and, and you started to use a Maya server today. Which one would you use? Um, probably Postfix. Um, I, 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 have, I have a great deal of respect for Vitsa when Vitsa was working on Postfix, he spent a lot of time looking at SendMail. He actually um, gave me feedback on SendMail. He, there were a couple places where he found bugs, several places where he found optimizations. Um, and I remember uh, one time, uh, Postfix took a lot longer to write than Vitsa had planned, like three times longer. And I sat down next to him at a conference before it came out at one point and um, said, so how's the mailer going? And he goes, well, it's taking longer than I expected. And I said, it's harder than it looks, isn't it? <laughs> and he says, it's been an exercise in humility. <laughs> so now Vitsa did, Vitsa did some very, very good work. I don't agree with all of his design decisions, but you know, I never agree with everybody's design decisions. It's, it's inevitable. Um, some decisions, you know, I don't like them, but they're still right. <laughs> um, Other questions? Every once in a while, you always hear somebody complaining about, let's get rid of SMTP or, you know, let's just ditch the whole thing and start over. I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on that topic. Right. Um, what was it? Ken Thompson was asked what the uh, uh, operating system of, you know, 50 years hence would be. And he says, I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be called Unix. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, SMTP is not a perfect protocol. Uh, SMTP is, however, probably good enough. The big flaw in SMTP is authentication. Uh, authentication is a really, really hard problem to solve because authentication by itself is not enough. You know, just because I know that you definitely are a spammer doesn't mean I want to read your mail. And so there's, there's a bunch of layers. I actually spent a couple years working on the problem. I did work on DKIM for um, uh, sender domain authentication and, and so forth. I have thought about it. Um, and I don't, I have not come up with the magic bullet. And I'm not sure the magic bullet exists. The, the desire to be able to exchange email with kind of anyone is antithetical to the I don't want to exchange mail with people I don't want to talk to, because how do I know if I want to talk to you or not? Uh, once again, if any of you have any um, fantastic ideas, uh, come on up, see me at the break. We'll share patent rights. <laughs> <laughs> One more question? Well, or not. <laughs> but looking at today, like looking at instant messaging, video, audio, would integrate anything of these into the, uh, would into the I, system? Would I integrate interactive? Well, first of all, you know, batch is already there. You know, MIME takes care of doing all of that. Interactive, no, I wouldn't put it into SMTP. It's the, the wrong place for it. Um, SMTP is a store and forward protocol. It's one of the reasons, by the way, why things like SPF don't work terribly well because, you know, they got the store part, but they forgot about forward. Um, you know, it works sort of okay some of the time. Um, but, you know, people, 
kind of a related question. I'll answer the question I wish you would ask instead of the one you did, like a politician. I don't think mail's going away. Um, it is being modified. Um, people are um, using it in some sense more appropriately. There are times when you want a record, uh, you know, anything business legally and so forth. When we start to do, actually I understand there was a discussion in one of the keynotes earlier. When we start to get into things like colonies on other planets, right? You're not going to be using IM, you know, or Skype or whatever because there's like a 45 second or, you know, actually for Mars it's like 10 minute round trip time. Okay, you're going to be using email for that. Telegraph. So, what? Telegraph. Telegraph, yeah, well, it's flash lights up. Um, so, you know, I, I think mail's going to be around for a long, long time. It'll get used differently. That's inevitable. Do you have a question? Right. Last question. What do you think about WAVE and uh, I, yeah, what do you think about uh, the WAVE protocol? WAVE? Oh, Google WAVE? Um, you know, I looked at it um, a little bit, but the problem is I didn't have anyone else to, like, play with it. With, you know, it's <laughs> one of those. It looks like WAVE could have been really interesting, and I'm kind of sorry Google gave up on it as early as it did, because I don't think they got a chance on it. But on the other hand, maybe nobody picked it up because there wasn't enough there to make it worthwhile. I honestly, I don't know the answer to that. It's an open source protocol. <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. so? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.